All right, so thank you very much, Cedric. Thank okay. You. Cool. Thanks for coming, everybody, to my talk about how to see with an event camera. And so here are the uh, contents of the talk. So I'll start with a gentle introduction. Um, I'll be introducing frame-based cameras and then talking about how event cameras work. Uh, and so in the first part of my talk, I will talk about continuous time vision with event cameras. Um, and then in the second part, we'll be talking about machine learning and convolutional neural networks. Um, and then I'll finish with a short conclusion. So let's wind back the clocks uh, 200 years. So in 1827, this is the first photograph taken, and it's a um, picture kind of from a window, and you can see that there is a, a picture of a man and there's some, some stuff. So it's not the best photo, but that's the first photograph ever. So a couple decades later, and we have our first color photo of this ribbon here. And then a little bit after that, this is really exciting. This is one of the first videos uh, ever taken. And at the time, they wanted to see if the horse's feet uh, were ever all off of the ground at the same time. And so you can see, um, yes, they are. And then quite a while after that um, was then the first digital image. And that's a computer scan of uh, Russell Kirsch's son, uh, his three-year-old baby. And then uh, I've included here at the end a couple of examples of high-speed photography. So here is a, a bullet going through an apple. Um, and at the bottom, this is a very impressive work from the MIT Media Lab. And they're actually showing a video at a trillion frames per second. Um, and so that is actually what you're looking at. That little uh, packet of light is actually a packet of photons. So you're literally witnessing light speed as it travels through the Coke bottle there. OK, so that was just a bit of a warm up. Um, and so we arrive at today on our timeline. Uh, and almost everyone in this room here has a camera just in their pocket uh, on their smartphone. And this is a very simplified uh, explanation of how they work. So you have a lens, and it focuses the light onto some kind of chip. Uh, and on that chip, there is a light sensor. Uh, and that light sensor is just an array of pixels. Um, and so the way that an image is taken is that you open the shutter here, and the pixel will collect the light for some exposure duration. And then uh, you close the shutter, and that is one image. And then if you want to take a video, you just repeat the process, so you get another image and another image. And then over time, you get this sequence of images, and that's a video. So I'll just start and talk about some of the drawbacks of this uh, method of capturing images. Uh, and then the first point is that there's redundant sampling. And what that means is that if I were to take a video of a still scene, uh, I would just be taking a picture of the same thing again and again, and so that's quite redundant. Um, and this also tends to lead to quite a high data rate. Um, so I've written there 1 to 10 megabytes per second as a rough ballpark for the types of data rates that you could expect. Uh, a second drawback is uh, that there is a low intrascene dynamic range. And so that means that uh, it's difficult for cameras to see bright and dark things in one image. Um, so, it, for example, in this picture here, you can see uh, it's overexposed. Um, and then you can use auto exposure to kind of adjust the exposure time. Um, but that leads to other problems such as flickering or when you look at the sun, the whole image goes dark. And the third drawback here is motion blur. And so if you look at the cup, um, yeah, there's been a heavy motion. And so the cup has been blurred. And that's because an object has swept past a few pixels um, during that short exposure time. So I'll talk about event cameras now. So they are inspired by biological eyes. So there's an event camera at the top and a human eye just below. Um, and so the key properties are that they are asynchronous. Um, so every pixel inside an event camera is independent. And they only report the changes in brightness. And so this leads to a very efficient way of collecting data. And they typically have a much lower bandwidth. Um, if the scene is staying still, then the bandwidth would be zero, so you would not need to transmit any new data. Uh, and up to maybe about one megabyte per second is reasonable. Um, these event cameras have quite a low latency, uh, 0.5 milliseconds, and in bright conditions, that number can be way down, even as low as 100 or 50 microseconds. Um, they have a high dynamic range, meaning that they can see bright and dark things at the same time. They consume a very low amount of power, just 100 milliwatts or less, uh, and they don't have any motion blur. 
So how does this actually work? So at the top, I've shown an event camera pixel, um, just one pixel from the event camera. And just underneath, to show that it is inspired by biological vision, these are the cells in, a, in an eye, basically. And so what happens if we, if we follow the path of the light? It comes and it hits the, uh, the sensor, and it generates a photocurrent signal in this section. And that signal is amplified. And so when, once we get to here, we compare our signal to a reference level. And in the pixel, it compares this level. And if the change in our current level is positive, it's going to trigger an on event. And if the change is negative, it will trigger an off event. And so when the event gets triggered, it resets the reference level to the new level. Um, and importantly, with the event camera, if the reference level and the current level are very similar or there's no change, then uh, no events are going to get triggered. Um, and so to see what it would look like uh, if we gave the event camera a, a signal, here we're just focusing on a single pixel. Uh, and the black line here is the log uh, intensity of the light signal. And what happens if we follow it along? The light increases, increases, and then at some point it triggers an on event. And then it, it, now the light's decreasing and we trigger an off event, and then another event, another event. And so you can see the output is these spikes, these events. Um, and importantly, the, the rate of these events uh, is not fixed in time. The rate actually depends on the uh, signal. So for example, here, there's not really much change, so there's a larger gap between the events. And this distance here that the light, the log intensity must change to trigger an event is called the contrast threshold. So it's the minimum change that you need to, to trigger an event. And the actual event itself contains a timestamp, uh, its own uh, XY coordinate on the pixel chip, and whether it has, and it has an on or an off for whether it was an increase or decrease in brightness. So the actual output of this camera if we look at this pixel circuitry, this is a Davis event camera. On the right, this pathway is an event camera, and the output is, looks like this. It's a list of events. Each row is an event uh, with coordinates, polarity, timestamp. And this camera also has, if we follow the top, a little bit of extra circuitry that is actually a normal frame-based camera. And so the, the camera outputs events and also uh, normal image frames at, let's say, 30 hertz. And so what do these events look like? So to a computer, it just looks like a list of numbers. Uh, but for humans, uh, for interpretability, we often plot either a 3D space-time plot, and that's here. It's a point cloud. And you can see the x and y coordinates of the image plane. But the third dimension is time. So we're plotting each event as a dot. And you can see that um, the image frames, you can see their relation to the events, especially in terms of the temporal relation. You can see that the image frames are quite sparse temporally, and in between you see lots and lots of events. So it gives you the sense that the event camera is very temporally dense. And here is another way to visualize events. If you just have start with gray, whenever you get a positive event, you make the image a bit lighter. And when you get a negative event, you make the image a little bit darker. And just a very quick comparison of some you know, other image sensors. And I tried to show the scale of these sensors. So this is a very high speed camera here. It's a huge machine. This is just a normal consumer DSLR camera. And then a human eye. And this is a little mini event camera, just to show that they can become really small, just the size of a thumbnail. And uh, these are some of the specifications. So for example, the frame rate. So this uh, high speed camera can go to 12.5 thousand frames. Um, you know, the DSLR camera may be 120 frames. The human eye can see it around 50 hertz. Uh, and an event camera um, has a very, very high equivalent frame rate uh, or temporal resolution. So here, about 10 microseconds. Again, the dynamic range, the event camera is orders of magnitude higher than the other sensors, consumes a lot less power. And the data rate is uh, much lower. And then the output of these sensors, so uh, just a sequence of images for the cameras, the human eye is going to output these nerve impulses that go to the brain, and then we kind of reconstruct an image. And then the events are outputting uh, events. So now I'll talk about uh, part one, which is continuous time vision with event cameras. So I'll start off with some related work. So in 
2014, uh, Brandly et al., uh, they proposed that you would start from the Davis image frame and you just add events onto the image to update the image. So you can see uh, in the top here, that's a Davis image frame. And once you add all of the events, uh, you can see an updated image uh, a bit further along in time. And what that looks like at the bottom, uh, if you remember the, the log intensity signal over time, um, once you add all of these events, you get this kind of step function, this uh, a quantized reconstruction of the original signal. So other related works. So in 2016, uh, both of these works came out in 2016, actually. So uh, Reinbacher showed that uh, you can accumulate the events even from a, a gray, a zero image. Uh, and as long as you reg is periodically smooth the image, um, it actually works quite well. So essentially, let's say every 10,000 events, um, you run a spatial smoothing step. Uh, and then you keep accumulating more events. Um, and then Bardot et al., um, they showed that you can actually do a joint optimization to compute both the image intensity here and also the optic flow. And the optic flow is just the direction that each pixel is moving. Uh, and here the color uh, encodes the direction. And so how the optimization works is it's framed over a temporal window of events. So you consider, let's say, 50 milliseconds worth of events. You take this uh, volume, if you like, and you compute the optimization. And then once it's converged, you just slide this window along to the next batch of events, you compute the optimization, and you get the answer. OK, so for our work, what we want to do is we have the Davis event camera, and it outputs these low frequency image frames and also high frequency events. So our aim here was to reconstruct a high speed and a high dynamic range video, also with low latency. And so what's our approach? Uh, so instead of doing what a normal frame-based camera would do, which would output just a sequence of, at discrete times, an image, um, we actually propose to estimate a continuous time image state that would be valid for all time. And this image state would be driven by the events that are coming in. And so we want our approach to be computationally efficient uh, so that we can use it on a, on a practical robotic application, for example. Um, uh, we'd like it to have very low latency. Uh, and that means that, ideally, we would update our image on a per-event basis. So that means instead of waiting like 50 milliseconds for the, all the events and then processing them, we want to process every event as they come in real time. And so this slide is just to introduce a bit of the notation that we use. So we model the events as Dirac delta spikes. Uh, and the, the timestamp of the event, TK, will shift the spike along in time. And so to get a whole sequence of events, it's just a sum of all these Dirac deltas at different times shifted. In the frequency domain, a 1 over s is an integrator. So it's equivalent to integrating the signal with respect to time. So when I write here a 1 over s e, it's like uh, I'm integrating these Dirac delta spikes. And the integral of the Dirac delta is a heavy side step function. And so you see that we get uh, this quantized step function response. OK, and so let's go back to the naive approach, which was just to directly integrate events. What happens if you just add events to an image? The problem is that all of the low frequency noise in the event stream gets accumulated by the integrator. And you can see that here in this example, behind the bicycle, uh, all of this noise that has accumulated onto our image uh, is just staying there. And so uh, a first try would be a high pass filter. And so what this is, here is the equation in the frequency domain. The high pass filter essentially um, takes a signal and the low frequency components of the signal get uh, attenuated or reduced, but it allows the high frequency components of that signal to pass. And so here is a Bode plot. So S represents a frequency. So when the frequency is large, the signal is uh, strong. And then when the frequency is small, you can see the signal is dropping. And so what happens here is that all of that low frequency noise here gets cleaned up quite nicely by the high pass filter. Uh, compared to just directly integrating. But there's still an issue with high pass filtering. And that issue is that now we've lost that low temporal frequency information. The filter has removed it. But for example, here is the background of that image. The background has a temporal frequency of essentially zero. It's like the DC gain. 
and uh, that is completely lost in our reconstruction. And so a natural question to ask is, is there a natural way to fuse the low frequency information from the image frames into our estimate? And so to do that, what we propose is to take the low pass filter applied to the image frames to extract the low frequency components. Then we take a high pass and apply it to our event cameras. And then the result is this reconstruction here. And you can see that you can see the background as well as the foreground quite well. And if you look at the frequency response, uh, at, since we're using a low pass and a high pass, the frequency response is uh, equal to one everywhere across all frequencies. So just to, I'll go over a couple of the equations to actually implement this uh, complementary filter. So again, the notation is a reminder. And C is the letter I'll use to represent this distance here, the amount of contrast threshold to trigger an event. So here's the equation of a complementary filter. It's the low pass filter applied to the image frames plus the high pass filter applied to the events. And so to solve this equation, we need to convert it to the time domain so we can use the inverse Laplace transform. And that's the ordinary differential equation that shows how the filter evolves over time. And to actually compute the solution of this ODE, we solve it in two regimes. So in the first case, uh, when in between two events uh, at a pixel, uh, we can set the term E equals to zero. Uh, and then the solution is very simple. It's this uh, equation up here. We can get the exact solution. And then we also solve at exactly the point of when an event occurs. We just integrate from just before the event to just after the event. Um, and then that results in uh, simply adding C to our image. And so what it looks like in practice is here is time. And whenever an event occurs, this purple equation applies. Otherwise, the green equation applies. And so we update our image state only when we get an event. And so actually, this makes it really computationally efficient. So we've measured that we can really reconstruct up to 20 million events per second. And that's typically far more than a real event camera would give. Uh, up to 1 million events would be quite a lot. Um, and that's on an i7 CPU. And this slide here, just a recap, um, it's the block diagram realization of this ODE. And so if you like, the events are at the top here and they're fed in and they're integrated. And at the same time, the signal feeds back over to here. And we take the difference between our image and the camera image, and that feeds into the filter as well. So over time, the filter is trying to reduce this error. So we're going, the image will look more and more like the camera image. But at the same time, it's being updated by these events. And that's how they're coming in. OK, and I've got a little video here prepared. So we'll see if that can go full screen. OK, so I'm actually waving the camera around here. That's the event camera. It's plugged into that laptop, and the screen is off. But it's essentially running just in real time on that laptop. Um, and on the left of my monitor, that's uh, a conventional camera, a frame-based camera. And on the right is our reconstruction. And so importantly, you can see, and here, this is a high pass filter. And so you can see that you can see outside the window uh, and under the desk at the same time, basically. Um, whereas the frame-based camera is suffering from uh, exposure issues. It's getting overexposed or underexposed or both. OK, and our contributions. So this is just to sum up this uh, piece of work. So we introduced the continuous time formulation for complementary filtering. We showed a, an asynchronous per event update scheme. Um, and we also did a real time implementation. And at the time, that was state of the art for image reconstruction. This was a couple of years ago now. Uh, but to date, it's still the fastest event camera image reconstruction code. Um, and we've released the open source code on GitHub here. And you can see some people are already you know, forking it and trying it out themselves. So that's really nice to see. OK, so I'll move on to the, to the next topic. So the next topic is asynchronous convolutions. And so the motivation for this is that uh, image convolutions are very well understood for images. Um, and they're a fundamental operator. But there's no equivalent operator for event cameras. So our idea was to extend our framework that I introduced just now and extend it to also be able to do spatial image convolutions. 
asynchronously. So I'll just go back to the basics for one slide and just to show, so here's the identity kernel uh, convolved with the image uh, leaves unchanged and here's a Gaussian blurring operation. The Laplacian gives you the edges of an image and here are the X and Y gradients and you can see that you can combine the gradients into a single image with uh, the color encoding the direction of the gradient. Okay, so uh, clearly the convolution is well defined for images, uh, but what does it mean for an event stream? And so the way that we visualize it is something like this. So we consider a single event, um, and it's got its timestamp, its x, y point, it's uh, a plus or minus one for polarity, and we draw it into a big image, which is essentially a zero everywhere except one pixel uh, for the event. Okay, so to convolve this, that makes sense. We convolve the image and we uh, get essentially this image with, in this case, six non-zero entries, but everything else is still zero. And then the key is to take this image and then go back and to convert it back into events. So here we've created this convolved event and that's essentially uh, all of these events have the same timestamp and they have a, a different magnitude depending on the value of the kernel. Okay, and so what can we do with these convolved events? Uh, we can pass them into our complementary filter that we just showed. So here I'm setting the uh, frames to zero, so this is just a high pass filter. Um, and we can see that in the case of normal events, we get an image. And if we do the convolution on the events and we pass the convolved events in, uh, we actually get out the gradient of the image in this case. So just here are some results that just show that um, you know, a similar slide to before, but all of these uh, images were taken by doing asynchronous convolutions on the events. And so you can see the X and Y gradients, for example, look quite good. Um, and just uh, as another way to show these results, here I've got the events on the left, and that's plus and minus events, they're red and uh, blue. I've got the gradient image in the middle here, in this middle column. And Poisson integration, that means that we take the gradient image and it's an optimization that will actually compute the image uh, whose gradient matches this gradient. So it's a way to reconstruct an image from its gradient. Okay, so what's an actual application for these gradient asynchronous convolutions? Uh, here we do corner detection. And so for corner detection, we co compute the Harris response and the way that we do it is that every time an event comes, we update the Harris response in a very local neighborhood. So actually reuse the Harris response from previous time steps. And if you threshold the response, it essentially highlights all of the corners in the image. And so here you can see all the corners from our method. And on the right, just to show that we've actually captured these sequences in very challenging lighting conditions. So this is like a pitch black night. This is like looking at directly at the sun. This is driving down the highway at nighttime. So the frame-based camera really struggles to find any corners in these conditions. And this last slide is just showing us um, a comparison to other event-based corner detection algorithms. So this is just uh, a few examples of some others. And I guess notably is that if we look at the bottom image here, we can see these ones get quite noisy, uh, whereas our corners are actually quite clean. And one of the reasons that they can become clean is that we can apply uh, non-maximum suppression to the corners because we're using the Harris response. And that's a reference, uh, a frame-based camera. Okay, so um, I'm up to part two. So in this part, we're going to take a step back from doing real-time computation and asynchronous uh, computations. And we're going to look at convolutional neural networks for event cameras. So the motivation for this work essentially comes from the fact that we understand convolutional neural networks uh, quite well now. They're a, a standard tool for computer vision uh, and they yield really good results for, for things like optic flow, classification, segmentation. And so we're really asking the questions, can the CNNs be used with event cameras, uh, for example, to reconstruct uh, high quality images? Uh, so I'll start off with some related works. So here we have the events over time. 
And the first question we need to ask ourselves is, uh, how can we convert this stream of asynchronous events into some kind of grid that can be used with a convolutional neural network? Uh, and so one of the solutions proposed is to create a 3D space-time voxel grid. And so that um, essentially is a discretization or a quantization of the events. So the events, the point cloud, raw point cloud looks like this. And after quantization, we may end up with something like five temporal bins, and the timestamp of the event is going to determine where it falls into the bin. And we will take a small window of events, a time window of events, and convert that into a voxel grid. Um, and then we can do that, we can repeat that process to create essentially a sequence of voxel grids that encode all of the event information. And so this approach uh, has been shown to yield state-of-the-art results now for image reconstruction, in optic flow, and in classification. So in this related work, I'll introduce E2Vid. It's a convolutional neural network it's proposed by Henri Rebecca. And the idea is you take the events um, and you pass it to this unit structure, this unit architecture, and the output is an image. And by passing a sequence of input voxel grids, uh, you can get a sequence of images output, uh, which is a video. Uh, and importantly, inside the unit architecture, it has a recurrent unit. And the recurrent units essentially allow you to um, memorize temporal information. They have a hidden state, and at every step, the recurrent unit can see the new input as well as the old hidden state from the previous step. And so at the bottom is a couple of his results. You can see this mug is being shot by a bullet. Uh, so the event camera obviously can capture very high speed phenomenon. Here, this is actually me sitting on a desk in Zurich. And on the left is a frame based camera, again, overexposed from the windows. But the reconstructions from the event camera, you can see quite a high dynamic range. So uh, an interesting point about this network is it's trained using only synthetic data from a simulator. So this is a simulator that uh, Henri Rebecca also wrote. Uh, and in the simulator, you can vary lots of parameters. You can change the type of scene, the type of camera trajectory, and even the camera parameters, like the event camera parameters, such as the contrast threshold, for example. So I've just shown a slide with his results here. So this is time going from left to right. And the top two rows show an object getting hit by a bullet. Uh, and so this is really cool that you can actually see the bullet there hitting the gnome and you know, smashing the mug here. In this third row, that's me popping a water balloon. And you can see the water is slowly falling out in very slow motion. And at the bottom is Henri popping an air balloon. So clearly, this method works for capturing high-speed phenomenon. And it seems to be working very well. But there are some limitations. And so I've listed three limitations here, which I'll go over all of those in time. Um, but we'll just for now start with the first limitation, and that is the computational cost. So at the bottom is a table. And here I'm measuring the compute time to compute one image on the Titan XP GPU. So it's a quite a powerful modern GPU. And if we look here, for example, at a high resolution image, or um, let's say medium in today's standards, uh, it's already taking 90 milliseconds to compute an image. And so that would be uh, the same as a 10 hertz video, essentially. OK, so what's our idea, our idea to improve the computational efficiency? Uh, one idea is basically to start from the E2vid architecture and to slowly remove components one by one, but always maintaining the prediction accuracy. So we don't want a poor quality reconstruction, but we want to see how much uh, smaller can we make the network to make it run faster. And so we eventually arrived upon this architecture. And uh, the input is the same event tensor or voxel grid. Um, and here, our architecture, you can see it's very small. It consists of just a few hidden layers. And each of these layers has 16 channels. Um, and it's got a gated recurrent unit here, which is the recurrent units, uh, residual blocks, and then a final prediction layer that converts the uh, hidden layers into a single channel image. And a summary of the actual performance is here. So we run three to four times faster than E2vid. So that's already a massive speed up. It requires far less computation, 10 times less floating point operations, 
That basically means that we're 10 times more computationally efficient than ETVID. And the really surprising result is that we really pushed it so far and we removed so many layers and so many parameters that we ended up removing 99.6% of the network. So we're basically using 0.4% of the ETVID network to run our full network. Um, and that's what we've managed to do. And we've got basically the same accuracy. So what about accuracy? That's on the next slide here. So this is a, an IJRR data set, and we've measured the accuracy on these metrics. So MSE, the mean squared error, the structural similarity, the learned perceptual image patch similarity, all of these are quite well-established metrics that compare the similarity between two images. In this case, the similarity between our reconstructed image and the ground truth image, for example, from a Davis camera. And we can see the numbers at the very bottom. Uh, that's E to vid and that's us. We essentially achieve a very similar accuracy on this data set. And that's confirmed here visually. These are just example images, uh, and they look essentially the same. OK, so great. So we can uh, improve the computational efficiency. Um, let's have a look a little bit deeper into what's actually going on. So I talked about recurrent units as a way to maintain temporal information over time because it can have access to the new information, but it also can see the previous hidden state from the last computation. And so here is an ablation study where we removed the recurrent units. And at the top, we can see with the recurrent units, over as the iterations go on, it kind of learns to fill in the image and color it in. But at the bottom here, if we disable the recurrent connection, the network just gets kind of stuck and it can only reconstruct the edges where all the events are happening. Um, but it doesn't know how to really fill in this image. So you get this kind of hollow outline image. So this gives us a clue that the recurrent units are really key, a really important uh, part of the architecture. And just a couple of limitations that don't really show up in the numbers very well. Um, but you can see that, uh, at least qualitatively, uh, our method is a little bit slower to initialize than E to vid. And that means that it takes a little bit more iterations to actually fill in the image. And then also, if you move the camera very fast and you have heaps of events, um, you can also see that we have a little bit more smearing of artifacts than e vid OK, and here's a video. So I'll just let this play. Uh, so these are sequences from the data set, from a high-speed data set. And here you can see the mug, the gnome, sorry, getting shot, and then the mug. And so as you can see, E2Vid on the left and ours on the right, they look very similar. They're a little different, but they're almost the same. So for the amount of computational speed up, uh, we believe it's really worth it. Um, and here's a different data set, IJRR. And you can see again, yeah, so the image quality looks quite similar. And yeah. OK, so let's go forwards a little bit. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the latest work over the last few months. So this is actually unpublished. We will be submitting this soon. And so uh, we really wanted to figure out a little bit deeper what are the important factors for training these neural networks, um, you know, such as the simulation parameters for the training data. Is it some kind of data augmentation? Is it the loss function or the architecture? And the aim was really, one, to outperform state of the art, of course, but two, to really guide the future research uh, direction. And so if we go back a few slides to the limitations of E2Vid, I kind of glossed over this, but one of the limitations is that E2Vid actually fades over time. So if you uh, have a look at this experiment, we just pause the events, and there are no new events coming in. And we ask E2Vid to keep reconstructing. And you can see every few iterations, it starts to forget a little more information until after 20 iterations, essentially, it's forgotten the whole image. So what's going on here? I'm going to explain a little bit about how to train recurrent neural networks, a bit of background. So the way that we do it is we take the, uh, the data, a sequence of data. We input uh, the first sequence, the first step, let's say, and we compute the loss. So we compute one image, we compute the loss, and then we do it again, and we do step two compute the loss. And there's a little arrow here to signify that the recurrent units has access to one is the new events. And it also sees the old hidden states from the previous step. 
And so we do this. In this case, the sequence length would be 4. We have all of these losses. And then what happens is we just accumulate these losses. In this case, we just sum them. And then we do one uh, backpropagation step. And so backpropagation just means that we update the weights of the network, and that's based on the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. So our theory here, our idea was that a shorter sequence is going to require fewer computational steps, so it's going to train faster, but that a longer sequence may be able to endow the network with a longer temporal memory. And when we do the experiment, we find that this is actually true. So E2Vid was trained with a sequence length of just 40 steps, uh, and ours was trained with a sequence length of 135 steps. And to give a sense of what these numbers might mean, for a 20 hertz video, 20 frames per second, 40 steps is just 2 seconds, 135 is more like 3 or 4 seconds, or 5 even. And uh, here is an image from a, a driving data set from MVSEC. You see that E2Vid is kind of fading out in the middle there, but ours is not. And just to push the um, yeah, just to push the point home, here is another video just showing E to vid on the left and ours on the right, and to see the difference that this sequence length makes. So yeah, we pause the camera, we just put the camera down on the desk, and you see E to vid is just fading uh, and forgetting everything essentially, but ours is actually remembering the scene. Okay, and then when you start moving the camera again, you see everything again, and again you leave the camera still and things start to fade for e vid <coughs> So the conclusion is that the long temporal sequences are key for improving the temporal memory. So the, the second point and the last limitation that we found with e vid is that it doesn't actually generalize well to other data sets. So this is actually an image from a real uh, popular event camera data set, the MVSEC data set, uh, and this is an image reconstructed using e vid and so uh, it's very difficult to say what it is. It clearly doesn't work. And so to understand what's going on here, I'm going to take us back to the contrast thresholds of the event camera. And how do you actually compute these, the value of the contrast threshold is not a trivial question. It's actually very difficult to do. And so what we propose, what we thought of, is to actually measure the event rate, which is the number of events per pixel per second. And now if we look at this plot, CT stands for contrast threshold. If we look at our synthetic data, uh, for a low contrast threshold, the event rate is kind of large, but as we increase the contrast threshold, the event rate drops. And that makes sense, because if you require a larger change in intensity to trigger an event, there's going to be less events. So we're using this event rate as a heuristic, as a way to measure the contrast threshold. Um, and now we, if we look at IJRR, that's the data set that E2Vid was evaluated on. It has quite a range of event uh, rates here and they're quite large, so that implies a smaller contrast threshold. And if we look at MVSEC, and that's a new data set, you can actually see that the event rate is much lower. So that may hint that it has a much higher contrast threshold. And so what we tried was we took E2Vid and we thought, okay, they're training with a contrast threshold of, in this case, 0.18 and a standard deviation of 0 0.03. And we thought, what if we just increase the range of contrast thresholds? So we generated uh, thousands of new sequences uh, with all different contrast thresholds from 0 0.2 to 1.0 or even higher. And these are the differences that we can see in terms of the results on the MVSEC data. And so this is a really striking difference. It's just showing us how important it is to really simulate the events accurately um, such that the simulated events match uh, real events from a real event camera. Again, e to vid on the left and ours on the right. And yeah, it's basically, you can't even tell what that is, but here it's quite a reasonable image. It's not perfect, it's still a little bit noisy, but definitely a big improvement. Okay, and in the last part, we uh, show an experiment where we actually train uh, the image as well as the optic flow, and we do this in a combined network. So what happens is we take the exact same network as E2Vid, uh, and E2Vid outputs one image channel, and all we do is we output three channels, one image, and then the X and the Y flow. Then we just suppose, impose uh, the L1 loss to the ground truth optic flow to train optic flow, and we impose the, the image loss on the image channel, and we train everything combined. 
So let me just let this video play and I'll explain what's going on. So this is again from the MVSEC data set. This is a driving scene. So in the top left is ETVID reconstruction, uh, and the middle is ours. And then on the right is actually the Davis frames. And yeah, they don't look very good, but yeah, that's them. Then on the bottom, EV FlowNet is uh, one of the state-of-the-art optic flow that has open source code. Uh, and there's our optic flow in the middle. And then on the right is actually optic flow, the ground truth that's computed using a LiDAR for depth and then the ego motion. And so you, the takeaway from this is that uh, ETVID and EV FlowNet are each quite a large network. Um, and we can do both these tasks using the same network. So essentially, uh, much more computationally efficient. Uh, and the results look quite reasonable. They look kind of similar. And when we compare the numbers, they're also quite similar. Um, but ours are actually a little bit worse. And so the surprising finding here is that actually our combined network has slightly worse performance than if you were to just do an image-only network or a flow-only network. And for now, we don't fully understand why this is happening. Uh, and so we actually leave this as a bit of an open question for future researchers as well to explore this topic. Uh, so what's going on here? Can we have a combined network that does both? The intuitive answer would seem, sure, you can do it. So then why is the performance worse? Is it possible that it will be better in the future? And here on this slide, I've just put a summary of all of the uh, differences from the e to vid and our method. And so we beat e to vid on uh, a whole range of data sets by consistently by about 15 to 30 percent. Um, and so the key differences are the contrast thresholds and that we use a whole range. Uh, the motions, we've simulated uh, a, a wider range of motions with uh, 2D objects flying everywhere, very slow motions, very fast motions. We've added this uh, data augmentation step of adding noise dynamically at train time uh, to simulate the noise of an event camera. Um, the loss, we use a very similar loss, just with uh, different uh, pre-trained weights. It's VGG versus AlexNet. Uh, and then this sequence length parameter, um, we found that using a sequence length of 120 works quite well. Uh, and also, we have the option to output optic flow. OK, and I'll just sum up uh, everything that I've just talked about. And so event cameras are these fast, they're high dynamic range, low power sensors. And so those are the pros, but the cons are that they're actually still quite noisy and very difficult to process using conventional computer vision because they don't give you the images. They don't give you good images. And so in part one, we show how we can actually obtain good images by using complementary filtering. And we show a very computationally efficient method. It's real time and we can show image reconstruction as well as convolutions. And in part two, we talked a little bit about machine learning and convolutional neural networks. Um, and so the difference is that this is quite a slower method compared to in part one, but the performance in terms of accuracy is a lot higher. And so at the moment, the CNNs are state of the art for image reconstruction and optic flow and a few other things as well for event cameras. Uh, and we've found that the training data used to train these networks is really important. And the, the key properties are the contrast thresholds, the types of motion, the noise parameters of the training data, the length of the temporal sequences, and these are all the key parameters for improving results. Cool. Thanks for listening. <laughs>